This is Ralph Lemmel of the Software Languages team in Koblenz, and this lecture is about functional data structures. This lecture is part of an introductory course on functional programming. Uh, this course is uh, mostly based on a textbook chapter on functional data structures by Chris Okazaki, as it's part of the handbook of data structures and applications. Um, so I assume that you're fluent enough in, in Haskell as such, I mean, basic programming skills in Haskell or functional programming. And of course, I assume that you know a little bit about data structures in one language or two, I mean, you know, lists, you know, stacks, things like that. And so here the emphasis is on functional data structures in this lecture. So here's the first definition by Chris Okazaki. A functional data structure is a data structure that is suitable for implementation of functional programming language over coding in an ordinary language using a functional style. So functional data structures are closely related to persistent data structures and immutable data structures. Um, I will clarify this later. This should be enough uh, for, for, for a start. And so here's our first functional data structure, a really simple one. So we look at stacks. Uh, you have seen this before, I assume, but you know now let's look at stacks from the perspective of functional data structures. So we've got these operations, empty, uh, for an empty stack, push to put an element onto the stack, top to retrieve the top element of the stack, if any, and pop to remove the top element. All right, so this is how we would do it in Haskell. I mean, it's really straightforward, right? Uh, but the point here is, it's functional in the sense, it, you know, these data structures are persistent. I mean, we never change uh, any existing stack, we rather create new stacks uh, when we apply operations, right? So it's persistent, it's immutable. And yeah, so we, we define a stack as a algebraic data type with these two alternatives for the empty stack and for the stack that is constructed from an element and an, another stack, right? And an empty is trivial, it's just defers to the empty constructor push, just uh, defers to the push constructor and top and pop just uh, destruct uh, the stack, I mean, uh, insisting on a non-empty stack, of course. All right? So, so the way that we see that this is functional, say, persistent, immutable, um, is, um, well, when we apply a push operation, right? So here we assume that we have some stack with three to one uh, in a stack S, and then we apply a push operation, then uh, the pre-existing stack is, is not changed, right? So in this case, we construct another stack and, and we are able to reuse, of course, the, the previous stack because we can essentially just layer uh, an additional element on top of the pre-existing stack. All right. So here's also how it works for the pop operation, right? So we have our bigger stack now um, and now we uh, compute uh, uh, a stack through pop. And while well, it happens that uh, we then uh, point back uh, to the to the stack that we started with, uh, so s prime prime equals s, right? Okay. Um, of course, we can also go and implement uh, such functional stacks in Java. Pretty straightforward. So each stack um, stores an element, and um, also a pointer to to the to the rest of the stack, right? And uh, an empty stack. It's just a null pointer. So then we construct a stack by taking an element and uh, a stack. Yes, and top and pop, they just return the element and or the uh, previous stack. So this is pretty straightforward. It's probably not the way how you would do it in Java. You would rather typically uh, implement perhaps stacks in Java in a non-functional way, let's say. So, so you would use a mutable data structure so just for comparison, so here you would have a nested uh, class node, right, to model the, the nodes of a stack, and you would maintain a pointer to the to the first to the top element of the stack, and you would have a constructor for to, to start from the empty stack, and push would actually allocate a new node and then uh, accordingly adopt the first pointer and top would turn the first element top pop would uh, forget about the first element. So this is the two ways of doing it. One is functional, the other one is non-functional. Right, so let's um, summarize the terminology and the characteristics of uh, functional data structures before we get to more complicated examples. So here's again our definition, right? 
uh, functional data structure. Uh, well, they are re related to persistent data structures and immutable data structures. So indeed, these three terms are used a lot out there. And uh, let's try to let's try to be more precise and and understand how they relate. Okay. So the term persistent data structure. Uh, this is basically about the constraint on uh, data structures that updates uh, do not destroy the previous version, right? So basically every data structure that we have at some point in the program uh, will, will be there. Uh, it will not be changed by subsequent operations. And then the term immutable data structure is uh, basically um, emphasizes a, a particular implementation for achieving persistence. So it, it basically points out that uh, you know no mutation uh, happens underneath, and then functional data structures. Um, th well, th this is of course uh, implies persistent data structures, but it's also about the fact that we use a functional style. You know, for example, pattern matching and of course functions to implement the operations of the data structure. Um, so let us also emphasize the specifics. Uh, you know, functional program specifics related to data structures. So again, I mean, uh, in, in a functional program language like Haskell, um, you have immutability anyhow, right? So there is no side effects. Um, another big difference compared to, let's say, imperative uh, languages is that we heavily rely on recursion when we implement data structures rather than some sort of uh, loop uh, construct. And then, I mean, let's say compared to C or other languages where you might actually use a lot allocation and deallocation when you implement data structures in um, functional programming, we entirely rely on garbage collection. And then we typically also use pattern matching to implement the operations of the data structure. This is sort of a convenience. All right, so there are certain advantages uh, one might claim that are implied by the functional style to data structures. So the, the, the hope is that uh, you get fewer bugs simply because uh, of persistence, uh, data cannot suddenly change, right? So when you have non-persistent data structures, like when you have an imperative style, then of course, uh, uh, someone, I mean, if you pass around data structures, someone might change your data structure whereas someone else might still assume that the uh, data structure is still in the state uh, as it was uh, before. So this, this can lead to a serious box. So um, what people then do in imperative setting is that they start to clone. So when, when they think that someone might change the data structure and they want to keep it in, in the original state, and they, then they um, start cloning. Uh, the nice thing is actually with uh, functional data structures, uh, you are not explicitly cloning. Uh, it's rather the implementation that takes care of copying to some extent. Um, and so there's, a, a, you know, if you're lucky, there's increased sharing. Okay. And then what people also have is when they uh, do a lot of cloning, um, well, then they actually might end up synchronizing at some point later in the program. And all this is, of course, not needed. Uh, if you do not clone to start with. Okay, so let's look at a slightly more interesting example because the stack example is very limited. It doesn't really demonstrate all the interesting issues about uh, functional data structures. So we are going to look at sets. I mean, sets of the kind that we have an uh, operation to build the empty set, an insert operation that we can basically add an element to a set, and of course, also a search operation to determine whether some element is in the set. And we will actually implement this set in two ways so that we can also understand some efficiency, uh, complexity um, differences. And this is the signature uh, that we use for these different implementations. Okay, so we parameterize over the element type and the actual type constructor for the set. Okay, so let's look at two implementations of um, uh, the signature for sets. Here's the first implementation. It's a naive implementation. So we use lists to represent the sets and we uh, just rely on equality for the element type. So the uh, empty set is constructed uh, as the empty list and insertion and search basically perform a linear search 
So we go over the elements uh, to find out whether the uh, element of interest is already in the list. Okay, so this is, uh, of course, linear complexity. This is a uh, terrible performance, uh, but it's a good starting point, right? So we can try to do something more efficient now. All right, so this is our next attempt. So we use binary search trees. So here we've got the uh, constructor for the uh, empty tree. And here we got uh, the constructor to take a left subtree and a right subtree, as well as an element to construct a, a tree from that, right? So what we assume here is, uh, when, we, when we say binary search tree, we assume that the elements in the left subtree are always uh, not greater than uh, the element at the root, and also the elements in the right subtree are not uh, smaller than uh, the element at the root. Okay, so this means we can really, in each step, we can um, uh, eliminate half of the search space, uh, assuming that uh, the, the tree would be sort of complete. So now let's um, implement search. So this is what we do indeed, right? So we uh, look at the element uh, that we search and we compare it with the element at the root. And so if, if the search element is smaller than the root, then we search farther only in the left uh, subtree. Um, if, it's, if it's greater than the element at the root, then we search um, uh, only farther in the right subtree. And otherwise, uh, E and E prime would be equal. And so then search completes with true. Okay. So here's also the insertion operation, very similar. Um, so basically, when we insert some element in the empty tree, well, then we just build a trivial tree with left and right subtrees being empty and a new element at the root, right? So if we have a non-empty tree in which we want to insert, then we again look at uh, the comparison of the in element we inserted, E, and the element at the root, and we uh, delegate insertion to either the left subtree or the right subtree. If, if we uh, establish that uh, we have the element already in the tree, then we don't change the tree. Okay? So now what's interesting is uh, how these operations really work. I mean, so insertion is really an update operation. And of course, we, we have a persistent data structure, so the original tree would never change. But uh, so we look here at the case that we insert eight into the tree, right? And of course, eight belongs uh, essentially uh, to the right of seven, right? Because it's greater than seven. What we can do here is we can still do a lot of sharing, right? So for example, this subtree here, uh, the left subtree of four, uh, well, we can still use because it's not affected by um, adding eight, right? And a few other things are also shared. But of course, we have to copy this entire parse towards seven, right? Because we add eight below seven. And so um, since we are not allowed to mutate uh, the existing tree, we have to copy at least this entire parse. Okay, and this is a, this is a very typical uh, characteristic of functional data structures that some uh, amount of copying, pass copying along certain passes of the data structures is necessary. I mean, we didn't have that for the stack, but that's just because it's such a trivial data structure. Many other data structures uh, do involve this sort of pass copying. And that's, of course, a complexity issue, or let's say at least we have to keep an eye on this, right? We have to always understand how much copying actually happens and whether these costs are um, acceptable, right? So we will come back to this, all right? So, but anyway, here's some benchmark results just showing that indeed um, the binary search trees are faster than the naive uh, uh, implementation of sets, right? So you see here we have some microseconds and here we have some milliseconds. So, okay, so we are much faster. Uh, so, by the way, the code for this is all online and you can have a look if you like. And I mean, also search is faster, so uh, not surprisingly. Okay, uh, perhaps a little bit of summary on this example that we just saw. I mean, this is still not a very practical implementation uh, because 
uh, we have to be careful that the trees here may not be balanced, they may not be complete in a sense, right? So they, they might degenerate to linear uh, structures and uh, of course there are known solutions for that, the EVL trees, red black trees, other such trees. But essentially, uh, even with these more complicated data structures, um, the, the aspect of pass copying still applies. Of course, what's also important to uh, understand is that this space complexity with functional data structures uh, is good. We very, very much also rely on the fact that uh, garbage collection helps here, right? Okay, so now let's look at a tougher example to see even a bit more of uh, functional data structures in action. In particular, we will also understand how laziness, lazy evaluation, as we have it in Haskell, for example, uh, feature interacts with persistency. Okay, so we look at priority queues. So these are the characteristic operations of those. So we again have a, a operation to construct the empty queue. We can insert some element into the queue. I mean, okay, I'll write heap here because we eventually will use heaps to implement priority queues. Uh, we have a find min operation. So that's how we feel that this is a priority queue. So we can basically always retrieve the minimum element and we can also delete the minimum element. Well, and we can also merge two priority queues in the sense that uh, as, as if you were inserting all the elements of one queue into the other queue, okay? So we will actually use indeed heaps uh, to implement priority queues. And what are heaps? Well, uh, it's basically a tree structure. So just uh, very similar to the binary search trees that we just saw. Um, uh, it's indeed also a tree structure where uh, we have the keys at the nodes. And so there are two kinds of heaps, max heaps and min heaps. So in max heaps, the maximum key value is always at the root. And this property is also true for all the subtrees recursively. And for min heaps, it's just uh, that the minimum key value is at the root. And, uh, you know, looking back at the operations for priority queues, we probably want to have a minimum heap. Uh, so, so the idea is in, in, a, in a heap, uh, we do have uh, the maximum key value at the root, but we do not have any particular order on the children. So this is different uh, uh, compared to the binary search trees, right? Where everything was ordered in a sense. So heaps are basically just partially ordered trees. And, um, and, this, and they are only partially ordered so that their efficiency, I mean, for the relevant operations is better when compared to uh, ordered trees. All right, so here's an example taken from Wikipedia. Um, this is actually a max heap. It's even a complete uh, max heap in the sense that um, the, the, uh, the height is uh, as good as it can be for the given size, right? So you see the maximum is at the, at the root. And then uh, again here, also the maximum is at the root, but you see there's really no order uh, um, across these different trees here. Uh, among the children, right? Okay, so this is the signature uh, of heaps uh, uh, in Haskell. So this is just uh, what we have seen before, empty, insertion, find minimum, delete minimum, merge. And you see we again parameterize as we have done this for uh, sets in the element type and in the type constructor for the actual uh, heap representation in this case. So you see, we also use the maybe constructor here to um, to uh, model that the find min and the delete min operation may fail to uh, return something useful, especially when they are applied to an empty heap. Okay, so yes, so we use uh, trees, just plain trees to represent heaps. Of course, with the additional assumption that the heap property is uh, observed, say that the minimum is at the root. And um, here is a, a first implementation. So of course the empty heap is represented through the empty constructor. And you see insertion is defined in terms of merge such that we basically construct a one node tree from the element to be inserted and we merge it 
than with the uh, the uh, previous uh, tree. So find minimum basically just looks at the root, of course, because we have the heap property, so the the minimum must be at the root, um, and we return nothing if the if we look at the empty heap. Delete minimum. Well, I mean it basically needs to take the left and the right subtree of the heap at hand and merge them. Right? And so merge is really the interesting operation. So you see if we merge a tree with an empty tree, well then uh, we just return the other tree. Um, if we merge two non-empty trees, well then we have to compare their roots and whatever root is smaller or equal uh, gets the root um, in, the, in the merged um, tree. And then we recursively uh, merge um, uh, the, the remaining subtrees. This is not the way how you would do it. Uh, so actually what you do rather is you apply some swapping here to the arguments of the merge operation. And uh, the simple idea is that this swapping helps in avoiding uh, the, the, the tree structure to degenerate into a list structure. Uh, I will visualize this in a second. Yeah, but that's the simple idea here. Here you swap around left and right subtree and also in these other calls you swap around left and right subtree. And this is actually how it, here's the net effect of doing this. So what actually happens with this definition is that the rightmost parses here of the operands of merge get uh, combined into a leftmost pass um, in the result. And, uh, and the, the thing is also that these elements here are ordered, right? So the leftmost pass is ordered. So this is how this swapping merge behaves of these few heaps. And the point is, if we would not be swapping, Obviously, then this, this long pass would end up on the right. And so you can imagine if we keep on merging ever increasing right most paths, you know, that would sort of go towards a linear structure. So this, this, um, this uh, consistent swapping of arguments makes sure that the, long, the, the, the long pass gets to the left. And so that in the next uh, merge step, for example, uh, we have a short pass here. So again, we can implement this data structure also in Java. I mean, uh, let's not spend too much time on this. It's, it's just, again, the same trick as we did for stacks. Uh, we just um, make sure that we never reassign anything here to, um, to our variables, that we rather construct new heaps um, when we perform updates, okay? I should mention though, even though this is really a very uh, direct uh, transcription of the Haskell code, if you like, this will not work very well in terms of runtime complexity. And we will see later how to revise this code so that it gets actually a comparative uh, complexity. So it's important to keep in mind that the trees uh, in this sort of implementation are not guaranteed to be balanced. That is. The, the depth of these trees is not guaranteed to be optimal. So this means we could uh, have uh, trees as the result of some operations that, um, that have a long leftmost or rightmost pauses. And then of course, if, if these pauses are very long, uh, subsequent operations uh, on, on, on these pauses and on these trees uh, would essentially have perhaps linear complexity. So here's sort of a result that when we insert certain elements in, in this order, then we get this long rightmost pass. Okay, but the idea is that we don't have um, long pauses by average. So let's try to understand the efficiency, the complexity of uh, our skew heaps. So what we, what we should do is we should actually imagine to, to look at uh, long sequences of operations, right? Um, I mean, the fact is that, of course, individual operations may be expensive in a sense that they may uh, imply linear time, right? So, for example, inserting a large element 
such as 7 into the tree here uh, would imply linear time because we basically need to go down the entire path here. Um, but the, the thing is, we if, if you look at a long sequence of operations, we should sort of average the, um, the runtime of the operations. And it turns out, I mean, it's not, it's not so easy to prove, and we will not do this here, but uh, of course you're welcome to read up on this. It turns out that by average, um, the operations in an operation sequence for uh, screw heaps um, run in logarithmic time. So we call this, this, this kind of average based argument, we call this a logarithmic amortized time. Okay. So here's also just a pointer if you want to read up a little bit more about this amortized uh, notion of uh, complexity analysis. Um, so again, the basic idea is not to take the worst case complexity uh, of an operation, which would be linear in our case, and to just multiply it with the number of operations. But it's, it, we, we try to get a better bound for the complexity by understanding whether expensive operations with, you know, with uh, high costs, say, with, with, let's say, in linear time in our case, are perhaps compensated for uh, by lots of cheap operations with much lower uh, complexity. And this is, this is the case for skew heaps. It turns out that by average we, we don't have linear time, but logarithmic time. Okay. You could actually play, for example, with the Java program that we have looked at earlier. And you, you would uh, measure that it looks like as if we have a linear and not logarithmic uh, bounds. You can easily construct a, a worst case uh, sequence of operations uh, where, you, where you easily see that it could be that you hit linear uh, amortized complexity. So what you could do is, uh, so we take again this tree here and we just insert many elements into this tree. So, and then rather than um, inserting these elements in the result of the previous operation, we just always insert again and again uh, some new element, or perhaps even the same element, into this tree. So then since, uh, of course, uh, all these individual steps take linear time, uh, so then would, we would also have um, uh, linear amortized complexity. So this is pretty bad, it seems. We would get uh, evidence for this if we were running the Java program. It would indeed behave linear. So, but if we measure the Haskell program, I mean, you're welcome to do that, uh, we would not observe linear behavior suddenly, not, in, not for this case and not in general, right? So it would seem as if we had a logarithmic amortized bounds despite our persistent approach. And the reason for this is that we have another factor in the game here, uh, namely, that pass copying, which is basically the, the cause of the costs that we have here, is not really uh, uh, applied uh, because of lazy evaluation. Okay, so because what happens is, uh, because we have lazy evaluation in Haskell, uh, operation applications such as merge, they are not immediately executed. Rather, they are sort of deferred until someone, uh, you know, a subsequent operation, for example, would ask for um, the result of the operation. So we can think of these uh, deferred operations as additional nodes in the tree. So we use these um, pending merge nodes here. So only once someone uh, would ask for the minimum, only then we would actually start to look at uh, these elements here and we would pick the right minimum. But as you see, we would only push execution of pending merges uh, as far as necessary because here we still keep these pending merges. And because of this laziness, um, the implementations of persistent data structures can be uh, very efficient. So it's important to realize that pending merges or in general, all these 
these pending operations, pending function applications, let's say in, in a lazy functional programming language, uh, they, they, they don't have any effect on the result, right? So they only have an effect on uh, the, the efficiency. So, so what's also important to know is um, that these pending computations would only be executed once. So once they have been demanded, let's say, um, then uh, the results are essentially, uh, the depending uh, nodes are replaced by the results. And so um, this, this gives us uh, another kind of uh, efficiency, not just that the operations are not executed unless they are needed, but we also make sure they are only executed once. Okay. So now, the, uh, the original implementation that we showed for Java, uh, um, of course, will not uh, benefit from laziness because Java is not lazy, it's eager. So uh, when we invoke a merge, we would actually really cause the, the recursive merge operations to be uh, executed. But it's generally possible to encode laziness in uh, an eager language. So what we have here is, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but we have essentially the ability to also represent skew heaps that are essentially pending merge, you know, have a pending merge at the root. And so, and then we basically, when we, for example, ask for the minimum or delete the minimum, well, then we might push resolution of pending merges explicitly. But of course, this we don't need to do in Haskell because the lazy evaluation of the language itself takes care of this. Okay, um, so you see it's a little bit complicated, right? Um, but um, you're welcome to have a look if you like. So this gets me to the summary. Um, so functional data structures uh, rely on persistence. And of course, we use functional style. Uh, we have looked at stacks, at sets and at heaps or priority queues. And uh, even though functional data structures may involve a fair amount of pass copying or copying, uh, they can be equally efficient, I mean, as, as in uh, an imperative setting. But of course, we need an uh, entirely different style, and we also need a different way of uh, analyzing the runtime complexity of the data structure. So, I mean, uh, you're very much welcome uh, to look at uh, the notion of amortized analysis a bit more, because this seems to be really the interesting part of this stuff. So thanks for listening.